Hello, I'm sitting here in my kitchen with Amelia. Amelia is the associate that I work with in my practice. I'll let her say hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm Amelia. This is a mushroom pressing device you'll be hearing clicking along as we talk. Yes. And Amelia works in something she calls TheraPlay. Wait, no, that's not right. TheraCare. TheraCare. And what she does is works with children uh, doing play therapy, but also in front of the parents and then gradually allows the parents to take over what she's doing. So it's dyadic with a focus on the child and there are um, collateral sessions. So she works, she calls them discovery sessions where she talks with the parents about what she's doing to make everything transparent about how she is um, helping the children along with their development. So we're going to ask her, I'm going to ask her today how she interacts with the children in the different zones. So we are talking about triggers and toolkits for children and how, uh, how does she interact with children based on what zone they are is part of your toolkits. All right, so let's start with the red zone. And let's start, would you like to start with positive red or negative red, Amelia? Let's start with negative red. All right, can I use this to wipe my hands? You sure can. Okay, oh, look what's going on here. This is not a cooking show. <laughs> but I do want to point out that what is happening right now is I am... I'm very regulated right now. I'm working with food. I'm working with my hands. I've got some mushroom dirt on my hands, a little earth on my fingers. I smell a lot of smells and I'm, and I'm very available right now. I am a person who could engage with someone who was dysregulated and remain in a zone that would cause co-regulation to occur. You're going to ask me something? No, I'm going to take these. Oh, you're going to take those things away from me. Okay. We're going to change our vignette a little bit. <laughs> so negative red. So your question, Betty, is how I want to know. I want them to hear about your demeanor, your, um, your, how do you co-regulate basically mm -hmm. with negative red zone? Yeah. When I see negative red zone, the first thing I do is uh, get quiet within myself and remember that uh, I'm going to err on the side of no talking or very little verbal interaction. And um, I start to connect with something that is just really simple sounds. So I'm only gonna work in sounds. And I also do select language specifically such as, oh, you need to, and I say the, to the child what I see, I see them kick someone, I see them hit something, you need to kick, you need to hit. And then I let there be a moment where I just pause and I just, let them observe me having observed them and feel the experience of me not having any judgment or issue with what's going on. And that in itself, I always noticed a, a, an adjustment right there, a shift in them right there where they realize this is not a problem and no one's going to stop me and there's not going to be a dis additional stress with this in this person in particular. And so they look at me and usually they'll kick again or they'll... Um, refute what I said. No, I don't need you, Amelia. I don't want your help. Oh, you don't want my help. Your body, your body knows what it wants. I'm going to get out of the way, but we, but we can't kick. And that's when I start to go in and protect any element of the home or a person who might need a little bit of protection. If there's a child, oh, but babies say, ouch, so can't, can't kick things that say, ouch. What, what doesn't say, ouch. Couches don't say ouch. The word ouch is in the word couch and bringing in humor almost as soon as I see that initial tiny recognition that I'm not a person who's going to make this hard or going to um, judge. judge them at all. Mm -hmm. Then I usually I'll go for humor pretty, pretty early on. Um, couches say ouch and that for their nervous system, what I see is also loosening and kind of opening them up. And then we, uh, and then I make sounds and faces that 
reflect what I understand. And that's that's that moment. My pause is to is to recognize with myself before I work with a child, when I see them in negative red zone, my pause is to look at myself and say, you know what this is. You have been here. What did I need? What do I have? What would I like to give them? And so then I make the faces and I make the sounds. I see that I'm backlit. It's working. You can see me right now. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I go, ah. <laughs> So in, the, in, in neuro-relational framework language, we call this matching. Matching. I match them. <laughs> um, I match. And that, in, that further per, gives them um, the support and the permission. Not that I feel that they need my permission, but they like permission since they get a lot of um, the opposite. opposite of the permission. I don't know what that word is. <laughs> Countering. countering they yeah. counter they get a lot of countering versus permission um so i get down there and i go oh, and i make the faces what can we hit you need to hit something uh and already now their nervous systems from what i observe are already starting to be co-regulated with me mine because the stress is there's the lack of stress from there being any resistance or countering. There's a permission and a support coming in. There's a reflection without any judgment, not only without judgment, but with within kind of an um, an invitation. I, I give off an energy and a, and a clear, I clarify that there's an invitation. Let's do this. Um, and when they've been very focused on hitting a person or destroying a glass object that can break and create a danger for the people in the house, my my repetitive, you need to hit something, you do, to say it again, can help. Usually, in most cases, it helps them focus on the fact that I'm saying, yes, let's do this. And they can actually go away from the glass object and the person and become more interested in where I'm going with them, where this is going to happen all the way, and there's going to be no um, need to repress or suppress. So they become more interested in my my invitation than in their initial projected intention with what they wanted to destroy. Um, and then we do it. Then they kick. And I always offer my body. I'm, now, granted, I'm very strong. I feel very confident in my body. Today, I worked with a kid who needed to just do some proprioceptive stuff. He needed to push, and he likes to push tables <laughs> with his feet. And I said, you can do it on my hands, you know? And so he pushed my hands, and I pushed against his hands, and he was exerting stress, and he was stressed. He had been sitting down for too long, right? So an example of when I also use my body, you can punch my hands. Wait, let me get a pillow, because I make sounds. And that feels, when they want to hit someone, a lot of times it's because they're, they get the reflection in that moment, right? Like, ah, wow, ah, you hit me. Oh! And, and um, sort of the confirmation uh, that they are, for one, they're engaging with someone. And for two, they get to see their power and their feelings kind of uh, take space in the room. So if I'm holding a pillow and a kid is punching the pillow, then I'm, I, whoa, oh, oh. Wow. Now it's, this embarrasses people, these kinds of theatrics. Some people and parents and caregivers are not prepared to involve themselves in theatrics. So you, in those cases, there, one can create a key of words or sounds that is just like, um, in a case of a parent who was very shy, who didn't want to be acting, I might recommend that they just choose an animal that um, exemplifies the level of power and aggression that has just been shown. And they might just be like, oh, dinosaur. And the next one, oh, that was just mouse. Do you, that was just mouse. Do you have a T-Rex? You know, and you don't have to act. You can still give information to the child that they are invited to come in and reflect to them that, that we understand the, the grandness of, of their, of where they are and what they're bringing to the moment. And I honestly feel that those moments, sh there should be a feeling of celebration because they are doing mental health care and that is always worth celebrating. And they and that's an association I believe they should have with the people who care about them that when you do this, we're we're glad and we're relieved and, and this is what we want for you. Um, but that isn't easy to do until one feels themselves, the, the adult feels themselves safe and, and, and is able to regulate enough to, like in my case where I have language and I have sounds that allow me to interact with a child where I know that they're, uh, the way I respond is gonna keep them interested 
in doing what they're doing and I'm going to still be safe while I'm doing it. And I, when I'm not safe, I say to them things like, I can play this game if my head isn't going to get hit. I can play this game if I'm not spit on. I don't play games where I get spit on, but I can play a game for a long time. And I offer them, whenever I have to take something a little bit away, I always give them something. I could do this for 20 minutes if there's not any spitting, you know? And they're like, okay, <laughs> I'll stop spitting. Let's keep going, you know? Ooh, if my head is safe, I can definitely my leg is going to be available. So these are all these, I don't, it doesn't work to take something away from them without showing them that it, it's not in any way going to prevent them from continuing to express fully and get it all out. Cool. That I think is negative red zone. You'll notice, you'll notice Bruce Perry's six R's of co-regulation being reflected in what Amelia is saying. She's she's making it relational where she it's safe to be with her she's not tripping the threat response system by showing any kind of disapproval she is staying with them throughout she's not sending them to go on a trampoline she's she is keeping it interactive it's relevant she mentioned what did you mention dinosaurs mm -hmm. she's using things that they can relate to she does use a lot of repetition where they do things over and over yeah. again. It is very rewarding, very pleasurable, rhythmic. With the most recent child who was in, uh, who's switching from negative to positive red zone with me, I actually do cre uh, create almost like a, a chant around what I do with the kids because that's very regulating, re like regulating for them. So I'll say to them, you gotta check in with me and they'll say, are you ready? And I'll say, yes, I am, bring it on. And they'll come to me, I got you. And I'll make the sound when I put them down, thunk. And then I repeat exactly that. So in the end, what they hear is, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, I got you, thunk. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, I got you, thunk. And then they get into it too. And even sometimes to be honest, I start beatboxing. I've been like, pts, pts, come on, come on, pts, a pts, pts, come on, come on, a pts, pts, come on, <laughs> practice your beatboxing, or just to be able to go bop, 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 go is enough for a kid to um, bring in another system and keep them regulated in that and help co-regulate in that way. Yeah. <laughs> I get, I'm all amped up because it's so fun. <laughs> it's so fun. <laughs> So rhythmic, repetitive, and then it is respectful. We are always respectful of the child. We are not giving them commands when they're too upset. We are not uh, in giving them any kind of um, admonishments or criticisms. And we're also respectful of the family and the culture. So we're careful to do what the parents will be comfortable with. And when they're not comfortable, we check in with them. We explain our rationale because ultimately we want the parents to be able to step in and do this too. Well, the proprioceptive. So I do, when I grab children in a playful way, um, it turns, it goes from me asking, do you think that you when they're available, when we've been playing a bit, do you think your body is going to run into that thing and break it or can, are you gonna be able to stop? And they show me usually and they run in and almost break the thing. Oh, your body went all the way through, it almost broke it. I might help give you some help. Not my, not I'm gonna stop you, you bad kid, but I'm gonna, maybe I'm gonna help your body. And then they do it again. Oh, I do need to help your body. Okay, I'm going to help. And right then is where it turns into play and oxytocin and proprioceptive. And that is that next step in the co-regulation. Then I get them. And I love something that Betty taught me about when they want to be let go. I listen to it. I repeat it. You want me to let you go? Oh, you really, I don't want to hold you if you want to be let go. Okay, I'm going to let go. And I'm going to count to five and I'm going to let go. And I'm always loosely holding them. And what I notice is that they actually have already stopped pushing. Now they're just being there in my arms. I'm not forcing them. They're not feeling stuck. And, but they are 
and they are pausing from their interaction with the thing they were trying to destroy. And I say one, two, three, four, five, and I let them go. And in some cases they do it one more time because they think that's how to get me to come grab them. And so they do it again and I come grab them. And then they actually stop wanting to engage the destructive element. This just happened two days ago. Uh, it's no longer about, I'm gonna go destroy a thing. It's, I'm just going to start running and you're going to grab me. I'm going to start running and you're going to grab me. And that's the repetition and that's that portion. Um, and then I wanted to just say something about respect, uh, which just gives me goosebumps and makes me want to cry because it's the most powerful element of any of this work that we do. And good luck getting a child to trust you if you're not really in a sense of respect for that person. And one of the things I do with children is tell them, I trust you. Actually say to them, I trust you. And I also tell them, I respect you, <laughs> you know, and not at the very, very beginning when they're going off, but right when it's, when I'm, when I'm asking for that first boundary, when they're kind of ready to start hearing me and I say to them, I don't want my head to get hurt. I can play this game. I trust you and and give them power in that such a gift of power to say to a child i trust you you are in this moment that other people call crazy that other people try to stop they try to avoid and i'm telling you i want this i celebrate this i invite this and i trust you and then they really want to work in a way with me that allows it to continue because their self-esteem is increasing in that time and their capacity is increasing in that time and i love that so I, that's the part i wanted to add <laughs> okay cut over to betty cut over to betty <laughs> all right thank you amelia awesome so next we are going to ask amelia we should have a show called ask amelia <laughs> ask amelia what do you do with positive red zone positive red zone <laughs> I'm going to move this a little bit. Positive red zone is so fun and exciting and tiring for some adults <laughs> and hard to say yes to sometimes uh, because the child is exuberant. There's a lot of energy moving. There's a lot of body parts moving around sometimes. There's noise. So first of all, positive red zone, my, my experience is that it's something to treat as a proactive um, action. It's something to do not in response to a challenge, but um, in response to a day, in response to a human being's life. Oh, we're going to need, you've had, a, there's stress in all of our lives and children certainly um, have countless it, uh, engagements with stress that we can't actually track to the degree that we would like. We can't really know what is stressing out a child in certain times and places. Um, so with the parents I work with, I recommend proactive uh, positive red sessions, I call them. And in those sessions, I like to first ask a parent, do you all, one of my questions is, do you all like rock music? Do you like to headbang? Are you dancers? Do you enjoy tumbling? Do you like to sword fight? And I, and I ask, I'm looking literally for things with which people have positive associations. And with a family, I'll usually ask them to carve out an hour if possible and recommend that they at least get in 15 minutes um, in the day if they can. When positive red zone takes place, the child tends to, the children I work with are usually wanting to jump off of things onto other things, onto people. <laughs> they're um, crashing things into each other. They're narrating themselves. They're saying, and then this snake attacked you and you got eaten. I get eaten a lot as in positive red zone. I get killed a lot in positive red zone. And then you died. And I say, oh, I'm dead. And you know, this is a really funny part because people get triggered when they hear language that has a ser uh, potentially has a serious connotation in other places in life, such as death, killing animals, babies. These things come up, I hear them. And my most common response in those moments to keep it positive and to keep the play going is I say, I'm dead, 
oh, I hate being dead. It's so boring. When am I going to be alive again? You know, and just actually there's a moment where they can, uh, there might be an incidental learning about the value of life that it's not fun to be dead for me. I liked it when I was playing the game and then it's fun for them to watch me play dead and act so bored <laughs> and be like, oh, how long is this going to take? You know, but it's that nothing is serious. So red zone is about letting this energy that is still rooted in stress. It is still a child doing mental health care. They're still letting out what could have at one point entered them as negative feelings, negative experiences, but we have the potential to create joy and to be in joy as they expel and express those feelings. So nothing is serious. You killed me. Oh, you've got my arm. Are you making an arm sandwich? I Can you put some mayonnaise on it, please? Because I really like mayonnaise, you know, and just keeping it silly and fun and nothing is wrong with anything they do. That's the part where we're partying. With my strong body, I also wrestle kids and I tell them to push me across the floor. I hold on to... Uh, the robe, the tie around a robe, when you have your, uh, your velour or your terry cloth robes, those are pretty soft. They don't bother people's hands to play tug of war with those ropes. And so uh, I'll ask a kid to get on one side of a rope and I will, you know, they'll pull at me. I can actually, if I'm a tired adult, which I am many days, I can just sit there I can sit with the rope tied around my waist, you know, and be like, you can't pull me over. You will not pull me over and give them a challenge where I'm doing very little work and not sweating at all. And they're just like gonna eventually be all hair plastered to their face because they're getting this great sweat. And the goal of positive red zone and negative red zone, but very much the goal of positive red zone is sticky hair, hair that's sticking to a, a light, <laughs> a light layer of sweat. And uh, a kid in a light sweat or a heavy sweat, a kid who needs to stop for a glass of water is having a great positive red zone. There is a, a great moment to stop a, a child for a glass of water. If there needs to be a pause, it can, it's always about care. It's like, well, let's stop for a minute. We got to put some water in you so you can keep going, right? If there are things you need your child to do while they're in positive red zone, it's always in the context of how do we keep this going? How does this continue for the longest amount of time? And, and how do we all get to participate the most? So if you need, like I do breaks, I put my hands on my face with these kids and I'm like, <gasps> and they know it means I need a break. And then, and I, and I have signs that show them I'm ready to go again. Maybe it's this, but it's things that are fun that they enjoy looking forward to. And during those breaks, I talk about what I'm doing. Oh, my body, my body's so strong. I used like a hundred points of energy just now. How And then because it's hard for them to wait because they're having so much fun and any stop in joy is like kind of actually a threat to their nervous systems that they're not going to continue to release and do what they need to do. I say, how many, how much energy do you want me to get ready for the next round? And they'll say a hundred or a thousand. And I'm like, you want a thousand? Um, I could probably get to 600 for 600. I'm going to have to set the timer for three minutes. That's how I get to 600. And they always say, yes, <laughs> they're like, okay, great get to 600. And then during that time, I'm relaxing. I'm, I'm, I'm being an adult. I'm, I, or I take a bio break or whatever. If I have to go to the bathroom, oh, my body, all of my energy is focused on the fact that I need to pee, <laughs> but I don't want it to, I don't want to think about that. I'll be right back. I got to go pee. Then I can just turn back into a monster. With positive red zone, two things happen. Not just one person gets regulated, not just the child is being regulated and taken care of in positive red zone. The thing about positive red zone is that one of the benefits is their being with their parent or their caregiver and they're getting that connection. I hear people say, she just wants attention. They just want attention. Absolutely, that's exactly what they want. And the only thing to do is to replace the word attention with connection and understand that that they and say that instead they just want connection they just need connection right so there's this connection happening and it's a draw on the parents sometimes they're tired it's the end of the day mm -hmm. so we try to be uh proactive about this and prepare for this when is a good time of day collaborating with the child 
guaranteeing the child there's going to be this day, this time every day where I play with you in this way and making sure that it has all the elements that are positive for all the people involved. We're going to listen to a great song while we do it. And dad is going to do his crazy dance that he does. And mom's going to, you know, take out that ball that she loves to bounce really hard that I get to punch every time it's up in the air and she catches it. And, and we kind of make a, it's almost like um, orchestrating a play and uh, letting a child come up with ideas and say, well, I want you to do this and I want you to do that. At which point you can say, oh, I'm not as good at that as I am at this, which is not saying, no, your idea is poor and I won't do what you want, but it is saying, it is putting a boundary out there if there's a physical limitation, if there's an emotional limitation. There are parents who, if they engage with their children in certain ways, will trigger themselves. Instead, when, when we are letting the child collaborate with us and saying, and creating what the red zone is gonna look like, which is something I'm encouraging my parents to do these days, say, Let's figure out, let's figure out who does what, who's really good when the kid wants to wrestle. Where do you, who do you go find for that? Who do you go find when you want to, you know, play, play the pushing game with an adult? And I wanted to mention the pushing game that in terms of, I think it involves both, both vestibular and proprioceptive engagings, engagement. The pushing game is a game a lot of my kids like to play where I push them and their bodies go back and it's got to be in a safe space and they come running at me again and I push them again and they come running at me again. So a pushing game is something that a not super strong parent can play and give that experience to the child. A wrestling game may take a strong parent who can really take the weight of the child and move them around. Um, but in any case, it's, it's not a moment of a parent throwing up their hands and saying, I'm going to be miserable and just, and do whatever my kid wants. And it's going to be no fun for me. It's very much about saying, that's something I'm not as good as that. I might get good at it. And it's great to put those out, those little moments out there when a child's asking for something and you're going to say no, to say, oh, I'm not good at it now. That's something I can practice maybe, but right now today I am good at this. For example, they might be good at laying still while they get a foot massage. Um, the foot is not the parent's foot, it's the child's foot pushing into the parent's back and all they wanna do is lie there and get this massage. That might be all they could do that day. Yes, red zone is always an opportunity to get a massage <laughs> <laughs> if your kid agrees to it. Laying there, having them pull, push. Um, one of the, I mentioned earlier, a person who just sits there with um, the robe. Um, what is this called? The tie on the robe around them and the kid tries to pull them and they're just sitting there, but the kid is having a great time, right? Um, the, the pushing game involves that. I talked about the fact that I'll lay on the floor and have children push me across the floor. Kids will roll me across the floor. And really what makes it rewarding for them is just those few little practice. And you might practice with your partner, those few little lines. You won't get me across the floor. You can't. I don't know if you're going to get me this time. You got me that time, but you're not going to get me this time. So they we're giving them all these little goals, <laughs> these moments of accomplishment. And then when a kid is pulling me, I just secretly have my hands down next to me and I'm inching myself forward. It doesn't take much effort if they're actually not strong enough to pull me so that they have an experience of just enough resistance uh, so that it feels good to their bodies. It feels gratifying to their to them emotionally and mentally. And I'm not exhausted <laughs> at the end, right? Um, so that those are those portions. And there's another part of red zone, a uh, positive red zone, that is when things get dangerous and there does need to be a boundary of some kind. Well, you almost got hurt. And just using the narrative, you almost got hurt. I love this game. I don't want it to end because you get hurt. How are we going to make sure you don't hurt your head on that? Mm, should we? And children usually pop in right there because we always want to collaborate with them, right? What can we put there? What can we do? Where should we take this game? How should we alter this moment so that we can keep doing this. And I, I want to underscore that that's inclusive of, oh no, I only have 100 units of my 600 units of energy left. How are we going to make this game keep going? I still want to play with you, but I need to lay down. 
And I do, the theatrics really help because when I'm doing the theatrics right now, as I speak into this video, I'm full of endorphins, full because my body's actually moving. I actually have endorphins that have started moving in my body. My adrenaline is going, dopamine is pumping. And where I wasn't earlier, even in the mood to get up off of the chair I'm sitting on, now I actually have the energy to get up and go do a lot of things. And that's the benefit of uh, being with your child in positive red zone is that you select things and, and hone things in a way that you have your own yes in your body. Your body says yes, not just your child saying, I want this and you've got to do this, but finding a way for your body to say yes, going in and doing your own mental health care, your own holistic self-care and creating an association with red zone play with your child, positive red zone play that you want, that you start to look forward to. And, um, and, and what we find is that actually the negative red zone may fall away to some degree, and in some cases may be replaced entirely with positive red zone in the proactive, with the proactive approach. And as that positive red zone gets expelled, as the tension gets expelled due to the positive red zone, the positive red zone also might happen less and less so that we get more green because there's not so much stress around the stress. Um, so positive red zone, negative red zone, arriving at green. And arrival at green is not... Um, immediately the time to start with the challenge. We spend some time in green, soak in the green like a tea bag in water. Just get the flavor out, let it fill it up, let it cool off, add some honey. I when when a child has been in the red zone and they get to the green zone, I often don't talk about them, talk about the challenge until the next time I see them. Maybe if we have a good half hour of red of red of green zone, I might say earlier today, we didn't think we were going to have any fun. And we found a way to have fun. I really liked that part where we found a way to have fun. Would you like to, do you think if we did that again next time, that it would work the same? And it's always inquiry to give, let their minds, their brilliant, young, open, fresh, <laughs> creative minds explore and do work and have that uh, that self-esteem enhancing, that capacity increasing experience of saying, yeah, I think that's a good idea. That worked for me today. I want to do that next time and experience this good feeling I have with you right now. And in terms of a challenge where maybe there was a rupture, um, I accidentally bonked the kid or I scared the kid or I accidentally said, oh, don't do that. And I yelled at them and I didn't want that to be part of our experience. I get to go back. If I didn't like the experience, I get to go back and say, I didn't, we played last week and we were having, we were doing, going along pretty well. And then we had that moment and I didn't, I didn't like that moment. You, you weren't, you didn't like that moment. I saw that it made you unhappy. And I kind of, I think that maybe I want to try something different. Do you have, do you want to try something different? Do you have any ideas? And the incredible inquisitiveness is such, um, it's so regulating for one, just for a child to say, just to say to a child, would you like to speak? <laughs> would you like to be listened to right now? Would you like all this space that I'm specifically clar clarifying is directed at you? And then allow them. And then if they give an idea that doesn't work, right? If it goes against like something that you can withstand, like, oh, I think we should, you know, pour water all over ourselves next time, but we can't do that in this context. Oh, doesn't have to be dismissed. Oh, we want to pour water. That would be really good when we're at grandma's house and it's really sunny. Here, water doesn't work because of whatever. What does work? And just keeping it there. And that's the going back to engage the challenge. But I like to err on the side of tons of green zone before getting into red zone. And the last thing I'll say is that if you are talking about a challenge with a child, one minute on, five to 30 minutes off. <laughs> one minute on, five to 30 minutes off, taking cues from them to know when they're ready to come back. There's no hurry. It's only going to give better results to give them plenty of time to keep their cups full so that they can engage the challenge.
I'm really glad to um, have gotten to share this Can kind of stuff. Can you give a little bit of Blue Zone? Oh, oh yeah, Blue Zone. Blue Zone is just, just uh, for me, Blue Zone is respect the wisdom of the body. That child has gone quiet. They're not speaking. They don't want to be spoken to. They're not engaging. Um, match, match. Ooh, I'm quiet. Maybe just a, an occasional look, but not a scrutinizing look. I got to figure you out. I got to fix you. I've got, I'm judging what you're doing. Just uh, very little, almost no speaking. They don't need to know my plans. They don't need to know my thoughts. They don't need to know my concerns. They have very simple needs at that point. They may be water, they may be food, and they might not be interested. So all I can do is just place water not say you need to drink this. You don't, they don't need to do anything. Their body is helping them survive something. In that moment, they're in a survival mode. And that moment is meant to, for me to honor that mode and to, um, and to support them. So in the case recently with my own, uh, with a child in my life, she was unable to speak, unable to engage anyone. I told her, all I said to her was, I'm going to put you in the car and I'm gonna make a nest for you at my house and you can get back into a ball and you can stay in a ball in a nest until you're done. And then as she laid there, I would put, I put a cup of tea down and I said, this tea might be good for replenishing all those tears that came out if you think you need it. She doesn't need to answer me. She doesn't need to drink the tea. I just want her to know that I'm tuned in. I have something for her. She knows where it is. And then put some food down to her. This orange is for you if you want it. I might wanna buy it. And that actually was something I did very intentionally. I might want a bite to show her I'm with you and I'm, and you're not really feeling here, but when you're here, I'll be here too. And we'll share again. And then eventually um, what was very important was that I just not, I put on some music that matched her mood, but I didn't try to fix her with like healing music, like her, someone else in her life had done. I put on music that would allow her to cry. I knew she liked that music. She did cry. I didn't speak, I cooked food. I let the sounds of chopping food happen around her. I, I chopped food that would nourish her body. She needed vegetables. I um, The sounds of the oven opening, the warm air coming out, the smell of the kitchen, me swaying back and forth to the music because I'm okay, because it feels good to take care of a child who needs you. It feels, it's regulating for me to create for a child what they need. That's how I, partly how I regulate in that moment, instead of worrying about that child, thinking what needs to be different? How can I change this? Just like, what creates health in, in bodies? What creates health in bodies? Quiet, silence, being with food, water, make those things available. I made those things available. She lay there a little longer. And eventually she looked at me, she smiled and she was ready. She grabbed the tea, she took some tea. Eventually she ate some of the mandarin. Next thing I know, she's like, can I have some pupusas? <laughs> and she wants all this food and I've got all this food. And I got then I got to say, I've heard that eating root vegetables is great when you're not feeling well. I made you some root vegetables. And then she just sees that all this quiet in all this time of quiet, he, the the medicines and remedies were being created and I'm available and ready for her on her terms. But uh, there's no rushing, there's no requests, there's no demands, there's no inquiry, <laughs> nothing. There's just trusting the wisdom of her body to sustain her life in that moment to help her get through something so difficult that she needs to shut everything off and 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 recharge her battery in a way that I can't understand and I cannot question. And it's scary. It's really scary for parents when their children have been quiet for a really long time, um, but their nervous systems do not bounce back under greater stressors such as inquiry and demands. So that's a little on the blue zone. Is that enough? Okay, great. Your next question is about combo zone. Yes. Uh -huh, where most people live. <laughs> um, I do a combination. <laughs> I think of them as being stressed. I think of them as um, ha needing to exert something. And I think of them as also um, protecting themselves in some necessary way. I like to really, with a child like that, I like to focus on the be with element. I think more than anything else and sort of start there just, oh, and, and say their name to them or look at them or repeat back to them anything they do say aloud. I'm going over here. Oh, you're going over there. Um, so that they know that I'm available, that I'm with them. If other people are trying to make draws on that person's nervous system, I might say, oh, she's over with that tree. 
look, she's doing a pretty cool, looks like they're doing, she's got a good game going with the tree. And I like the kid to hear me say that what they're doing is okay. Um, I found that when I give emphasis, when I notice what children, what, what they're doing and maybe what they're doing well or what they're doing that's interesting and I just notice it and I very gently unobtrusively feed back what I notice then they sometimes become interested in engaging me a little more about what I've noticed oh well actually I really like to kick they might say oh well I used to be on a team oh you were on a team next thing I know they're allowing me to help create dopamine in their systems by talking with me having my eye contact my attention my presence they get to experience my being present with them. And that's when the co-regulation is happening. It's it's the being with, for me, with a combo kid, um, with great regard and respect for whatever they are available to do. Um, no commands, no demands, no judgment. Uh, I think that is basically it, is that focusing on the child, making them feel that you have that connection with them, because the reason why they're trying so hard to get your attention is because people are regulating. So what they're looking for is co-regulation. They're looking for, please put your eyes on me. That will settle my nervous system. Please talk to me. Please see me. And so that's what we do.